Welcome everybody and thank you for coming to today's presentation on From Soil and Seeds to Nutritious Vegetables, a how-to guide. I want to thank the San Mateo Public Library for inviting Master Gardeners to come today and present this information to you. My name is Janet Gilmore. I'm a UC Master Gardener volunteer. Just a little bit about the UC Master Gardener program. Um, all of us volunteers are trained and certified by the University of California to provide research-based information on horm, horm, home horticulture and pest management. And we do that through these free classes and workshops. We staff a helpline office where you can email your gardening questions and we participate at plant clinics and other tabling events. So come out and find us. All right, now I would like to introduce our presenter, Nick Landolfi. Nick is a research immunologist and lifelong gardener who became a master gardener upon his retirement from the biotech industry. He is a soil specialist. He regularly staffs our helpline office, and he coordinated, coordinated our new master gardener training for, the, for San Mateo and San Francisco counties. Nick frequently lectures on soil science and best gardening practices. He enjoys maintaining his vegetable garden and fruit orchard, as well as caring for a Japanese garden with a koi pond. Nick, welcome. Thank you, Janet. And thank you, Michelle, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I understand you're starting a seed um, collection or seed exchange program today. So in trying to come up with the most relevant topic, I felt something like starting from soil and seeds to nutritious vegetables was specifically relevant. Now if you're a beginning gardener, I think you'll learn quite a lot. If you're an experienced gardener, much of what I say you may already know, but I'm hoping that you will get some new information. This is an expansive topic, but I broke it down into these uh, subtopics. Number one, soil. Number two, seeds and germination. Number three, transplanting those seedlings. Four, seeding and plant care after they're in the ground. Five, harvesting. And six, soil rejuvenation and planning for the future. Let's start with soil. Soil is probably the single most important factor in terms of successful gardening. You want to have healthy soil. While plant selection and um, uh, looking in terms of sunlight limitations and temperature, carefully selecting your plants, you can overcome some things that are specific to your gardening plot. But if the soil is deficient, you're really uh, going to be hindered in your success. The good news is healthy soil is easily achievable with a basic understanding of soil science and the appropriate maintenance. You may be surprised to find out that the ideal soil composition is about 50% air and water, roughly 25% of each. The other half of the soil consists of the minerals, the particles that basically make up the physical portion of soil, sand, silt, and clay, and then organic material. Now, these percentages are very, very flexible. These are estimates. You can certainly have less of each of these components. But the air and water is particularly important. If you compact your soil, there's less space for both air and water. So the plants really don't have the opportunity to thrive as they could otherwise. Okay, exactly what is healthy soil? Healthy soil is alive. Okay, it contains a multitude of organisms, many shown here on this particular slide. They range from the microscopic, bacteria, fungi, uh, protozoa, to the macroscopic, 
earthworms, beetles, snails, slugs, those types of things. All these organisms work together to make the soil healthy and to provide an excellent environment for vigorous plant growth. These organisms compose what is referred to as the soil food web. That's shown here on this slide. What this shows you, if you look at the color of the arrows, is that some of these organisms consume each other. All of these organisms basically um, consume organic material, as you can see in the, um, the lower left corner. And their waste products provide nutrients for the plants. Their bodies themselves provide food for other organisms. And it's this soil food web that supports not just soil life, but also other life. Things like birds, fall, um, small mammals, and uh, arthropods, the micro and macro arthropods. Healthy soil has a healthy food web. How do you create healthy soil? It's pretty straightforward. You need to regularly add organic material. Adding organic material improves soil in a couple of ways. Number one, it provides nutrition for the soil food web, for all those organisms you just saw. Number two, it enriches the fertility of the soil. These organisms make nutrients available to the plant that the plant can thus utilize for vigorous growth and productivity. It improves soil structure. I won't talk about soil structure today, but suffice it to say that soil structure is the way the particles in the soil are arranged, such that there are pores for air and water. If you have a healthy soil, you're going to have a good soil structure. Adding organic material increases the capacity to retain nutrients in the soil. And finally, it enhances the water holding capacity. The USDA claims that a pound of organic material can hold 18 pounds of water. So you can see that's, a very, that's very advantageous. The simplest way to add organic material is simply to add compost to your soil. That's all I'm going to say about soil today, right now. I want you to gain an appreciation that the soil is indeed alive. Don't think of it as a section of dirt in your yard that you want to stick plants in. You need to care for it as it is alive, and this will go far to improve your odds of success in gardening. So the key points are, the soil is alive. Air and water collectively compose about 50% of an ideal soil. A thriving food, um, soil food web enhances the fertility of the soil and thus the vigor of your plants. Adding organic material, and while there are other things you can add, compost is the, the simplest, will improve the soil in a variety of ways. That was a very, very abbreviated discussion of soil science. If you are interested, there's a two-part series that I was part of that talks in more detail about the characteristics of soil, the physical, chemical, and biological characteristics of soil. I also should mention this, uh, these two seminars, recorded seminars, are on the Linkso Community Resources tab uh, of Linkso Garden Materials. It's a great place to look for gardening-related topics, and uh, it's worth your while to take a look at there. You'll most likely find something you're interested in. Okay, that covers soil. Let's talk about seeds and germination. This is kind of the scheme of what goes on when you decide to start a garden. Hopefully you start with a garden plan. You know what you want to grow, the types of things you want to grow. You then can take basically two routes. Select and purchase seeds, germinate those seeds, get them ready to put into the ground, and then transplant them into the ground. Now you can take another route, it's a little simpler, takes a little less time, 
and that's simply purchase your seedlings. And just for a rough estimation of time, look at the time scale on the far right side of the slide, and this is in months. So you can see, you can save a considerable amount of time if you purchase your seedlings. But there are some disadvantages. Here are some advantages of using seeds. Number one, the biggest one really, is increased variety. If you look at seed catalogs, and I'm sure you've all looked at those, there are multiple varieties of tomatoes and peppers that you can select from. At a nursery, you won't necessarily have that wide a variety of plants. So you have a much better selection if you start from seeds. It's lower cost. The cost of a seed packet is roughly the cost of a seedling. So you can save a fair amount. And you have better control over the timing of when the seed was germinated as well as its nutrition. You know when you fertilized it. Okay, that's not necessarily the case with seedlings. You basically get what's available at the time you purchase it. There are good, some good things about seedlings, of course. Number one is the convenience. I already mentioned the cost. That's not necessarily an advantage. It's lower risk. If you plant four seeds, you may get four plants, or you may not. If you go into a nursery to buy four plants, pretty much you're guaranteed of coming out with four plants. And then there's the instant gratification. If you remember the time scale, it takes a few months to go from seed to seedling. It's not the case. You can walk into a nursery, a matter of minutes, come out with a seedling that looks pretty good. So if you take care with your seed selection and the germination conditions, this will go far uh, a long way as to ensuring your success. The first thing you should do, as I mentioned, is have some kind of a plan. And I think it's important to build upon your experience. If you've grown something before that was very successful, it's not a bad idea to repeat that. If you've had a few failures, maybe try once, but you know, don't beat a dead horse. Move on to some different variety or a different type of plant. You have to be realistic. If you have a four by eight plot for your vegetable garden and there are three or four people in your household, you probably don't need 12 tomato plants or five zucchini plants. Know what types of yields you want and what you can reasonably use and plan around that. And finally, devise some type of a schedule. You want a good feeling of when you want to start your seeds, when you want to transplant those seedlings, and when you are expecting to harvest the produce from your garden. Let's talk a little bit about having a plan. This is um, a plan for this year for my garden. It's a, a plot that I have, um, both peppers and tomatoes and eggplant in, actually. And it's a good idea, and you don't have to have something this fancy. A uh, legal pad and pencil is fine. Write down what you want to plant where, paying attention to space requirements. But also, take advantage of your own personal experience. And I'll tell you a little story here uh, concerning the bottom row. I like to plant peppers in this front row. And if you look at any pepper... Um, seed packet or read online about how to grow pepper plants, they will tell you place your plants 12 to 18 inches apart. And for years I did that. Pepper plant, 12 to 18 inches, another pepper plant. But I wasn't quite satisfied with that. This particular bed, by the way, is a little over five feet square. So there's not an enormous amount of space. So one year I tried planting two pepper plants of the same variety next to each other. And that worked fine. Well, now I got six plants into the space that I normally got three. Next year, I tried putting three plants in each grouping. That worked fine, too. I now had nine plants. Of course, I wanted to push the envelope. I tried to do four groups of three plants, and it was pretty much a disaster. The plants were too crowded, low productivity. So now my standard for this particular bed is to plant three plants together around a single stake, so if I need to stake them, I can. 
and this works just fine. This underlies uh, what I mentioned before. Use your own experience, experiment, try things. Actually, I should say, it's not like there's a single correct way to do gardening. Okay, there's no golden book in the sky that this is the way it must be done. There are many ways to succeed. You should experiment and find out what is successful for your particular situation and build upon that experience. Let's talk a little bit about seeds and seed selection. There's an enormous amount of information in seed catalogs and online about the various varieties. Pay attention to the climate and growing conditions. Pay attention to the harvest time and yield. Okay, you can easily find tomatoes that will produce in 60 days. You can equally find those that will produce in 90. It's probably best to use some mixture if you want a, a productivity over a long period of time. As I've mentioned before, pay attention to space requirements. Now, I've also told you you can push those things with uh, appropriate exp experimentation. But the seed um, companies give good information on spacing, and you should pay attention to that. Seed selection should also take into account disease and pest resistance. You can buy individual tomato plants that are resistant to six or eight diseases, and that's a good thing, especially if your particular situation, the tomatoes are prone to diseases. So pay attention to that fact. And finally, it's a good idea to use a trustworthy source. Uh, I bought seeds on Etsy, I bought seeds from Amazon, it's fine sometimes, uh, but a good company that has an established reputation is really your best bet. There's an enormous amount of information and they're often willing to help you out if you have specific problems. And that's a big advantage. Let's talk a little bit about germinating the seeds. There are really two ways to do it. You can do indoor seeding, which is kind of what I will focus on today. That has certain advantages. It's a controlled environment. You can have timing control. You can start your seeds, such as the seedlings are ready to go when you want to plant them and it can extend your growing season. I routinely start my um, tomatoes in February and they're ready to go in the ground at the end of March and the beginning of April. So, and those, the months between February and April are not necessarily conducive to gardening outside. So, by starting your seeds inside, you can increase your growing season. Direct seeding, for some things, is really essential. Many plants more or less require direct seeding, things like bean, corn. They really don't do well if you try to germinate them in pots and then transplant. If you direct seed into the ground, one of the things you eliminate is transplant shock. And what I just mentioned, those, um, those types of plants are very susceptible to transplant shock. But any time you take a plant out of its environment, somewhat disturb the roots, there's some level of stress you're imparting on the plant. Most times they will recover from that, and, and so you really want to minimize it. And then if you direct seed into the ground, you'll have pretty good root development because the roots are never disturbed during transplantation. They start out and they've never been disturbed. For optimal results of indoor germination, you really want to use a seed starting mix specifically formulated for that process, okay? Never use native soil from outside. It's just not appropriate. You may get some success, but it's really not ideal for germinating seeds. Avoid using regular potting soil. It'll work actually probably most of the time, but it's not specifically formulated for seed germination. The much better choice is to use a blend that's been specifically formulated and designated as a seed starter mix. What are the characteristics of such a mix? It should be well draining. It should have a light airy texture so that air and water can have easy access to the roots as they develop. It should be sterile. You don't want any diseases. Um, germinating seeds are uh, 
especially susceptible to disease, and you want to eliminate that possibility by using a sterile uh, seeding matrix. And then you want something that contains some level of nutrition. Okay? Be aware that the seeds, the seed itself contains sufficient nutri nutrition to start germination for that root and let that root go out and start looking for nutrients in its own. Once it does that, you want those nutrients to be available in your seed starting mix. Your germination strategy should make your overall plan the number of plants you want to end up with. Expect some level of attrition, so maybe do 50% more. And if you have extras, you can either discard them or continue to care for them. You'll be very popular amongst your neighbors and friends to give these away. Timing. Pay attention to timing when you're germinating seeds. You want to plant them when they're not root bound, but when they're ready to go in the ground. And I'll talk a little more about that in just a moment. And then, as I mentioned several times now, space constraints. Be realistic. Okay, uh, a tomato plant in a four inch pot looks cute. It's two inches square, maybe three or four inches high. Four months later, that plant is six to eight foot high. It's two foot in diameter. It takes up a lot more space. You want to be realistic. There are multiple strategies for germinating seeds. You can put them in uh, many types of containers. Uh, here are some here, the nine pack, a six pack, a couple sizes of pots. Uh, any of these will work. You simply have to have a strategy for what to do once the plant is um, germinated. I'm going to tell you the way I do this. Again, it's not necessarily the best way. It's a way that's always been successful to me, and I think it, uh, I think it works rather well. These are handy tools for germinating seeds. It's simple stuff, a couple scoops. Plastic spoon works great. Um, there's a chopstick here, half a chopstick, a set of chopsticks. That these are actually really wonderful. If you break them correctly, you'll have a wider top portion and a narrower bottom portion that you can use depending on the situation. These little skewers, wooden skewers, are also very valuable, as you'll see in just a moment. The screen thing, I don't know what it is. It came, with a, uh, came free with a pack of seed labels um, that I purchased, but I really like it. It's, uh, it's got a little shovel on the end for removing seedlings, and it's got these, these wide forks to help aerate the soil uh, before you remove the seedlings, so I use it quite frequently. This is a strategy that I use for germination, okay? You simply take your seeds, you take a, I do this in four inch pots, take one of the wooden skewers, you dip the skewer in the water, and tap that skewer on the, the tabletop counter to remove the big water drops, but it's still wet. You can then use that skewer to pick up individual seeds, as you can see here, and place them exactly where you, you want them. This is much easier to do than trying to put things in with your fingers, much more accurate. After you place the seeds, simply tap them down with the other end of the skewer and cover them up and they're set for germination. Another strategy is to use soil blocks, and this is basically a plastic-free strategy. You can buy this device, and if you use the proper consistency of soil mix, you can make these little blocks. You can then place an individual seed in each block and allow them to germinate. The advantage of this is, as you can see on the far right side of this slide, if you have plants in plastic containers, when the roots hit the plastic, their tendency is just to go around and around looking for more, uh, more soil. An interesting thing happens with soil blocks. Because there's no surface there, the roots hit air when roots hit air, they don't go any further. It's air. What they do do is branch further back. And so you get a much more um, concentrated root ball with seed blocks. Then you can basically let the seed block, uh, the seedling develop in the seed block and plant 
the seed block into the ground, you've used no plastic in, in generating your seedlings. Once you have the seeds in the ground, you want to germinate them. I know putting uh, your seeds on a window in sunlight sounds like a great way to do it. In reality, it's probably the worst way to do it. The best way to germinate seeds is have a, um, a strategy where you use a heat pad and a grow light. That way you can control the conditions. The conditions in a window are just too variable. Doing something like this gives you strict control over the conditions. This is um, a bookcase in my office that I've taken over for seed germination. You see it has a grow light on top. What you can't see is that it has a, um, a heat mat in the bottom of the tray that holds the pots right above that white um, towel that's there as an insulator. And I can set this up so the plants get 16 hours of light every day and that the heating mat controls the temperature of the soil. Actually, let me take a second to tell you how heating mats work. They don't heat to a specific temperature, but rather they heat about 8 to 10 degrees above the ambient room temperature. So if you keep your home at 68, have a setup like this, the heat mat will uh, heat to 76, 78 degrees, and that'll be the degree, that'll be the temperature of the soil sitting on the heat mat. And that's very conducive to seed germination. So heat mats are important. Here are a few other germination hints. Make sure that the seed starting mix when you plant the seeds is moist. Remember the seed has all the nutrition it needs to start the plant, but it doesn't have really little or no moisture. So you want to have water available. You should monitor these daily to prevent drying out, especially on a heating mat. It's very easy, believe me, I've learned this more than once, it's very easy to skip a couple days and the plants will become dry and that is lethal for newly germinated seedlings. Always water your seedlings from the bottom. Place uh, the pots with the seeds in a tray water from the bottom so capillary action moves up through the pot and the roots move down to meet that water. That's really the best way to water. If you try to water from the top, you're disturbing the soil, you're moving the seeds around. It's not ideal. And then finally, keep the distance from the light source to the soil about six to ten inches. This will avoid having very leggy type seedlings that are trying to reach out for sunlight. Actually, this is something that happens almost exclusively with um, germinating seeds on the windows. The plants are always trying to get more uh, sunlight. So if you, um, if you remember, and actually let me go back, uh, you may have noticed in the bottom of this, well, the seedlings are in a tray, and then I have an inverted tray underneath just to get those seedlings a couple inches closer to the light. As they develop, I'll remove that bottom tray and then there'll be more space for the seedlings to grow. Depending on the plant, seeds can germinate somewhere between six and 21 days. Tomatoes are, are depending on the variety, it's not unusual to see seedlings emerge in seven day. Uh, peppers always seem to take much longer, at least the varieties I grow, 14, sometimes 21 days before you'll see germination. It's, it gets to the point where you really wonder um, if this has been a bust. So you have to be patient. Once you have your seedlings at this particular stage, what you want to do is up-pot the seedlings, okay? Separate them so they can be in their own individual plots. And this is the way I do it. Um, you can see on the left there, I have probably nine or 12 tomato seedlings that are in a, uh, in a pot. And I separate them. Very gently remove the plants from the pot. Now, this seems like a, um, a potentially damaging 
process, and in fact it can be if you just yank the seeds out. But if you gently remove them, you can see you, you retain a fair amount of the roots. You can put these in another pot, fill that pot with soil, and now your seedling is ready to grow in preparation for putting it into the ground. After you've up-potted your seedlings, you need to take care of them. Again, they're going to require another four to eight weeks of growth. You want them to become um, very sturdy, resilient seedlings before you put them into the ground. So let them grow under protected conditions. If it's, uh, you've grown these inside, keep them inside. Um, now, sometimes space is a problem. That's my problem. My little bookcase in the office won't um, well, it might accommodate one pot with 12 tomato plants. It won't accommodate 12 tomato plants. Uh, so I have an area similar in the garage. It's a little bit cooler, but again, the use of heating pads brings the temperature up, and so it's, uh, it's where basically I expand my germination process and, and seedling care. Again, if they're on heating pads, always monitor so they don't dry out. It's very important. Always water from the bottom again. You want the capillary action to bring the water up to the plant. Then when plants are getting close to being put outside, the best thing to do is a process called hardening off. All this simply means is that you want to make the plants, uh, you want to let them adjust to outdoor conditions, which are very different from the conditions they've grown up in, in sort of a, uh, a gentle way. It's very simple how you do this. Uh, first day, put them out for a couple hours in morning sunlight. And the next day, you can increase that, maybe double it to four hours. Slowly increase exposure to sun so that after you know, three or four days, you can leave them out in afternoon sun. And now they're getting used to sunlight because remember, they've only been exposed to artificial light. Sunlight's very different. For the first week, I would bring them inside just because usually at the timing this is done, uh, it's still getting cold. For example, this was probably done in, in March. And especially this March, we were getting down into the low 40s. But then with time, you can let them stay out overnight. And after maybe a week, 10 days, of this slow sort of acclimation to the outside, they're ready to put into the ground. Okay, that covers soil and seed germination. Let's talk about transplanting the seedlings. Before we do that, let's go back to this diagram. Now remember, we've pretty much stayed on the left side here, but there's another path, and that's the right side. And you can simply go ahead and purchase seedlings and, and then transplant those into the ground. And you can save a lot of time. But you won't get the satisfaction. <laughs> Before you transplant your seedlings, you should prepare the bed. Okay? You want to remove any old plants from last year, any weeds. But don't just yank them out. Cut the plants off at the surface of the soil. Okay? This leaves the roots in the ground where they will decay naturally. Remember one of the ways I told you, uh, actually the best way to improve soil is add organic material. Roots are organic material. They're already added to the soil. Why not take advantage of them? Actually, I'll tell you a little story. The, um, for years, de maybe decades, uh, you know, the end of the tomato season, I used to yank out my tomato plants I used to pound the root ball on the ground, and I used to toss it in the garden waste. Okay, then I started learning about soil, soil science, and I realized I'm damaging my soil in at least three ways. Number one, I'm yanking out perfectly good organic material that's been integrated into the ground. I should leave that there. Number two, along with that organic material, I'm removing all the soil life, the bacteria, the fungi associated with those roots, and tossing that in the garden waste. And number three, I'm opening up this hole, this 
I've allowed the soil to develop, and it's a protected area for all these soil organisms. Now there's a big hole where the tomato plant used to be. Okay, the simplest thing to do is cut the plant off at um, soil level, let the roots decay naturally. Sometimes with a big stock, especially things like, um, well, even tomatoes, but broccoli and sunflowers especially, very thick stock, um, the whole thing won't decay. But over time, what you'll ha end up with is just basically a little stub. It's, it's easy, very easy to discard. All the rest of those roots have been added to your soil. You want to rake and level the soil surface. You want to um, minimize deep tilling. That's something that's disruptive to uh, sort of the soil structure and soil life. So it's best to just minimize work at the surface. It's a good idea to amend the soil with organic material, as I've um, mentioned. Ideally, you want to do this one to four weeks before you actually plant. Because remember, you want that soil life to get going before uh, you plant. And then you want to um, water the soil one to three days before you're getting ready to transplant. Actually, I have a um, somewhat, admittedly, corny analogy, but I, I think it's informative. You know, when you go to bake a cake, virtually every recipe, step one is preheat the oven to 350, 75 degrees, right? And then you take that... Uh, you then go to the next steps, add the ingredients, certain pans, stick it in the preheated oven, right? If you do that, it's a pretty high chance of success that you're going to get the cake that the, um, whoever developed the recipe wanted you to get. It's going to have the right taste, the right size. You don't have to do that. You don't have to preheat the oven. You can put the ingredients in the pan, stir it up, walk over to the oven, turn it on, put in the cake. You'll get a cake, probably won't rise as much as the cake, probably might not taste as good, it's certainly going to take longer to bake, so those ingredients are not going to live up to their potential. Okay, this is very similar. You want to prepare your soil so that your plants can live up to their potential. Transplanting the seeds, this is common sense and very straightforward. You want to dig a hole that's equivalent to the size of the pot. You invert the plant, catch the pl allow, allow the plant to go through your fingers, catch the root ball, carefully place the seedling into the hole, fill with soil, tamp down gently. Don't really tamp down. Remember, you want to maintain space for air and water. And then water and mulch the seedling um, after it's planted. Okay, here's some examples of uh, seedlings that are a little too far along. The one on the far, your far left is um, more or less acceptable. You see some roots, you can see there's good root development. Um, they are starting to curve around in some areas. It's a little bit different from the central panel. This is considerably more root bound. Lots of the roots now are starting to become entangled. Probably would be fine, especially if you tease the roots apart before putting them in the hole. And then this last example is you can see the bottom quarter inch of the, um, of the pot is, is basically filled with roots. This is a sunflower. Sunflowers have very deep roots, and basically these roots are just circling around looking to go deeper in the soil, and the pot's just not that deep. This is something I just started doing this year, and I think this is great. Um, this is a real time saver for me. And that is to use a bulb planter for um, uh, transplanting seedlings. I don't know. I never thought of this before, and, and maybe everybody does this. I've never seen it before. But if you use a bulb planter, and it's just this cylindrical device that you can press down into the soil, and you can remove a core of soil, as you can see in the third panel there, and then you can put the seedling right in that hole and uh, fill it and then mulch. It's much easier than using a trowel to try to make the right size hole. It's, it's much cleaner. The soil comes out in a nice uh, cylinder. Um, I really like this strategy. I, I would urge you to try this. Okay, some hints for success transplanting seedlings. Again, a lot of this is common sense. Choose the right location. You want to transplant your tomato seedlings in the sunniest part of your garden because they need a lot of sun. 
If indeed you're transplanting in the spring, you want to be aware of the overnight and soil temperatures. How cold does it get at night? How cold is the um, soil currently? And you want to make sure things are above 50, 55 degrees, uh, the soil temperature at least, uh, before you put them into the ground. Adding organic fertilizer to a planting hole is important, I think. Um, the, I just add a little bit of organic fertilizer to the bottom of the hole, mix that in with the soil and put the plant on top of it. I think it's important to give the roots a good nutritional environment when they're starting out, especially after transplant. Provide support if needed. Um, this panel on the uh, right here is um, a newly planted tomato seed, uh, tomato seedling, and you can see I use a little piece of twine just to tether it. Um, afternoon winds kind of pick up where I live and I hate seeing my little plants being knocked over. So this gives them good support. And then as the plant grows, I simply move this, um, uh, uh, this twine up to keep the, the center of the plant um, basically it, somewhat attached to the pole. I also use tomato cages around. When the plant gets really big, those cages will support the, the foliage, the exterior foliage. And then mulching around the transplant is important. I haven't mentioned much about mulching, but mulching is important for soil. It, it really helps retain moisture. Mulch is organic material. It will degrade over time, adding organic material to your soil. So mulching is very important. Um, here's another hint. I think using jute twine for plant ties is ideal. You know, you can buy the, the plastic um, ribbon tape. You can buy wire-coated or uh, paper-coated wire. Oh, there's all kinds of plastic stuff available there. I really don't think you need any of that. Jute twine is biodegradable. Uh, the one thing you do have to do is tie a knot on each end because there are multiple strands that unravel over time. But if you do this, you can use them for three or four years. Uh, and when they've reached the end of their life, you simply compost them. They're biodegradable. There's no reason to use plastic plant ties. Let's go to seedling and plant, plant care. Again, much of this is common sense. Probably many of you are familiar with this. Water regularly once they're in the ground. Okay, You want to make sure that there is sufficient moisture. The best moisture probe is your fingertip. Simply stick it into the ground and see if the ground is moist or if it's dry. If you do this, you'll have a good feel of what the water level, the moisture level is around the roots of your plant. Fertilize if needed. Um, as you'll see shortly, I believe healthy soil, really healthy soil, doesn't require that much excess fertilizer. But it's not a bad idea to add some balanced organic fertilizer to your soil. Because remember, every time you remove a fruit or a vegetable, you're basically removing nutrients from that soil. And you need to replace those. And in the majority of cases, appropriate organic material will do that. But it's okay to use a little fertilizer to help out that process. Prune your plants if it's required or desired. Um, I like to prune the first uh, 10 inches of leaves off the bottom of my tomato plant so there's a good um, sort of air cushion between the ground and the plant, good for air circulation. Um, I had a uh, zucchini plant last year that would have taken over the entire, uh, the entire bed if I didn't vigorously prune it and it still produced sufficient zucchini. So it, pruning is something you need to do. Well, if you need to do it, there's nothing wrong with pruning. And then it's a good time as the plant's growing to serve for pests and diseases. If I see any indication of disease on a, a tomato leaf, I'll remove that leaf or move that branch um, immediately. Okay, let's talk a little bit about fertilization. As I mentioned, my belief is that if you have really healthy soil, it needs minimal fertilization. Okay. If you want to fertilize, I think that's fine. Always use organic fertilizer. I like to fertilize at the time of transplanting. As I mentioned, I think it's a good idea to have those nutrients right concentrated at the, uh, 
at the roots of the plant. Here's some examples of common organic uh, fertilizers, bone or fish meal, worm castings, composted manure. Those are all um, solid form, powder form. And, and always use composted manure, never use uncomposted manure. It's, it's really not good for the plants. Um, some liquid fertilizers you can add to the water when you water your plants, seaweed extract, fish emulsion, and compost tea. Uh, these are common examples. All right, let's talk a little bit about organic versus inorganic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers are made from organic material, plant or animal material. Okay, and they're uh, basically they're all organic and they feed the plant, but they feed the plant through feeding the soil life. Okay, that soil food web, organic fertilizers for, um, feed all those organisms. And those organisms in turn make nutrients available to the plant. Okay, inorganic or chemical fertilizers provide nutrition directly to the plant. And this bypasses all that soil life. So why is that bad? All right, this is the nitrogen cycle. This is a complicated slide. There are lots of intermediaries and, and um, chemical compounds on it. Don't worry about any of that. That's not the point. I'm not going to go into it in detail today. But what I do want you to appreciate is that there is a nitrogen cycle. Okay, you're probably aware that nitrogen is extremely important um, nutrient for plants. Okay, the N of the NPK number on fertilizer stands for nitrogen. They really need nitrogen to grow and develop properly. Our atmosphere is 77, 78% nitrogen. Okay, so there's plenty of nitrogen around. Ironically, plants can't excess atmospheric nitrogen. Okay, it's in a form that they can't take up. So they need it to be processed in some way so that they can use it. That's why the nitrogen cycle exists. Okay, it's simply a, a set of organisms and reactions that take either atmospheric nitrogen or nitrogen from decaying organic material and turns that into forms of nitrogen that the plant can use. If you use an organic fertilizer, you're basically feeding all these organisms. And you're feeding that soil food web. And they're providing nitrogen in a form the plant can use. But let's say you want to use a chemical fertilizer, something nitrate-based. Um, sodium nitrate, potassium nitrate, ammonium nitrate, these are all common fertilizers. Um, you can add that to the soil and your plant will take up that nitrate. And you'll see a, uh, a tremendous effect. Any of you that have used uh, any of these fertilizers or for example miracle Grow, you'll see a rush of vegetation growth. It's almost amazing how quick because you're feeding the plant directly. But you're doing it the at the expense of all the other soil life, and you're diminishing those organisms. The best strategy is really to use an organic fertilizer. Avoid chemical fertilizers. Okay, let's talk about harvesting. Your plants have grown, they're producing produce, you want to harvest. Again, much of this is common sense. You want to harvest when the plants are mature, or when the produce is mature, but not necessarily overripe. Um, if things get overripe, that's, uh, that makes it very easy for it to be lo lost to pest. It doesn't necessarily have to be ripe to be lost to pest, but when it gets overripe, it, it really attracts them. You want to stagger uh, your harvesting so that you basically maximize the supply. In three weeks, you can grow one 18-inch zucchini. In that same three weeks, you can probably grow three six-inch zucchinis. I think you'd much rather have the former, or the latter, so uh, harvest regularly, and that'll encourage increased production. Manage the frequency. A tomato sometimes will have several red tomatoes on it. 
it's fine to harvest one and leave the rest on the plant for, for future harvest. Careful handling when you harvest is important. It's always best to cut rather than try to yank out. There are some, some tomatoes actually are very easy to pull off the vine, and then some aren't. To minimize plant damage, it's a good idea to, to simply cut the, cut the produce off the plant. And then attention to storage details can make important, uh, can make important difference in your harvest. These, um, the tomatoes on the far right, your far right, is a variety called Celebrity. They are good for 14 days plus on a kitchen counter. Actually, never put tomatoes in the uh, refrigerator. It really does nothing for them. Um, they'll last 14 days on a kitchen counter, whereas the, uh, the tomatoes on the left side, the, this is a, a variety called Constellato Florentino, um, seven days at the most. Uh, they're very easy to uh, they, they, um, degrade much more rapidly than the celebrity tomatoes, the, the ones on the right. And then, um, and, and basically that's it. Pay attention to your storage uh, details and your plants, uh, your produce will last longer. Another um, thing you may consider is harvesting for seed saving. Now, up until now, everything I've talked about is purchasing seeds. You don't have to do that. You can save your own seeds, and it's relatively straightforward. The key is you want to make sure you're saving seeds from either an heirloom or open pollinated, they're essentially the same thing, variety, and not from a hybrid or F1 variety. Uh, the reason for this is simple. The, the heirloom and open populated varieties are relatively stable genetics. So a seed from those plants will be very, very much like the parent. The seed from the produce of a hybrid plant will contain a mixture of both original parents' qualities. So rather than being an F1, it is now an F2. And those um, qualities will not necessarily um, stay together. So you'll get a tomato, no doubt, but it might not have the qualities that you originally wanted to save those seeds for. You should allow this vegetable to completely ripen before you select your seeds, or before you save your seeds. Uh, this is especially, it's not that important with tomatoes. Once they become red, it's usually pretty good. With peppers, it's very important. You should really let the pepper um, stay on the plant as long as possible to optimize uh, the chances that your seeds will germinate from a pepper plant. You simply remove the seeds from the pulp and allow to air dry and then store them. Now for tomatoes, there's a, um, a little better strategy, and that is to allow the, um, you put the tomato seeds in a little bit of water, air spores of fungi, fungi from the air will basically form a little mold on top of that water, and those organisms will digest the gel that's around tomato seeds, then you can rinse those seeds free of the fungi as well as the, uh, the digested gel, and you have nice dry seeds, the type of seeds that you get in a seed packet. So that's worth doing for tomato seeds. You want to store your seeds in a cool and dry place. Uh, there's no reason to use a refrigerator, although if you have the space, that's fine. And if you want to, you can test germination by placing several seeds in a damp cloth and just letting them incubate in a warm spot for a week or, or a little bit longer and see how many germinate to give you an idea in the future uh, what type of germination you can expect. Okay, let's go to the last topic, which is soil reju rejuvenation and future planning. Again, a lot of this is very straightforward and common sense. You want to clear out all the old plants from your vegetable bed Leave the roots in the ground. It's integrated organic material, it's valuable. Add more organic material to your soil. Scratch it in the top couple of inches. Keep the soil mulched. Remember, mulching is important for maintaining moisture. And remember, the soil is alive. You want to provide all that soil life with some level of moisture. So if it doesn't rain for three months in the winter, 
it's probably a good idea to water your vegetable bed maybe once a month just to keep some level of moisture there, to keep that soil life alive. And so basically that's the last point. Prevent your drip bed from completely drying out. That puts the soil life at a disadvantage. Another couple things that I think are important for future planning is to sort of summarize your results and your observations with what happened during the current year and make suggestions to yourself for next year and then base your future garden plan on this information. And here's just a few examples from last year for me. These are general notes I have on the variety of plants I grew. You can see some things worked out, some didn't. Uh, it's, it's much better to write this stuff down right at the end of the growing season than it is to try to figure it out um, four or five months later in the next spring. I also like to make suggestions. Um, these are suggestions I made for this year. I wanted three, ver three plants each of these two varieties of tomatoes and, and one variety of, uh, of cherry tomatoes. Uh, and you can see the rest here. I will tell you I didn't follow this. I ended up growing, putting in four plants of each of the two varieties. I did both Sun Gold and Super Sweet 100. It's not unusual. You sort of change your um, outlook. But at least I had a basis upon which to, uh, which to make the decision. So with planning, execution, and intention to detail, uh, it'll provide you with a productive, attractive, and satisfying garden. Now, there are just a couple of other things I want to, to tell you about. Number one, Janet gave you an overview of the Master Gardener. The Master Gardeners have a helpline. You can uh, submit your questions to that helpline, either via email, um, you can actually call the hotline number, or you can walk in. These various um, locations are staffed on the hours shown here. So you can get answers specific to your question by accessing the San Mateo San Francisco Master Gardener Helpline. And uh, the website there at the bottom is the general um, homepage for our organization. It has a lot of information and I would encourage you to um, explore that. Um, we have a monthly newsletter you can take a picture of this and go to the site and sign up. Again, you're getting the slides, so uh, you'll be able to do that. Uh, it's informative, and, and most likely you'll enjoy it. And then finally, I attach these three slides. Um, a, a fellow master gardener, Carol, Carol O'Donnell, took information from um, Pam Pierce's um, Golden Gate Gardening book and sort of customized it for San Francisco, San Mateo County. And this chart tells you when to transplant seedlings or plant seeds for the various months. And she developed three of these. This one's for the sunny areas of uh, San Mateo and San Francisco County. There's a third one for the foggy areas. Same information. The months change a little bit. And there's a, a, a third one for the hot southern area of San Mateo County. The, um, these are available on the website. They're kind of hard to find. So I've put the, um, uh, the site location, the site address, really, on the bottom lower left there. So you can go directly to that. And that's all the content I want to talk about today. Thank you very much for your attention.